Okay. <clears throat> this is where we left off. We're talking about factors that contribute to resistance. And they were smaller lumen, more resistance, more opposition of blood flow. So in other words, what's slowing blood down? What's decreasing the pressure? What's slowing down its speed? The, the opening, you know, the size of the lumen, the how many blood vessels you have. What I put, these were just examples. And then the thickness, how thick your blood is. <clears throat> so that's where we left off. <clears throat> so since the pressure, since the resistance increases a lot when you go from an artery to a vein, you have a challenge, as I was saying last class, you have the challenge of delivering blood up your legs back to your heart. So your, your veins in your legs, therefore, have valves that kind of keep this blood moving in one direction. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so there's the valves. You have a couple of, your body has a couple of mechanisms of helping your legs to get the body, to get the blood through the veins. <clears throat> One of them is in your calf muscles. When you take a step, the muscle, your calf muscles squeeze the, the vein and that pushes the blood up past the valve. And then when you lift your foot to take the next step, that blood, if it tries to flow back, and it does often, the valve will stop it. And then when you take the next step, you're squeezing that, that vein again. So every time you're stepping, you're squeezing the vein and it's helping to push the blood up. And it won't go backwards because of the valves. So that's one mechanism. The other, um, yeah, so the other one is called the respiratory. This is called the skeletal muscle pump. This one's the respiratory pump. So here is your diaphragm, how it normally is, like relaxed, right? So the diaphragm is a muscle, it contracts, and when it contracts, the diaphragm flattens out. So the diaphragm's right underneath your lungs, it separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And the, the photo on the right side shows the diaphragm being relaxed. The left side shows it being contracted. When it contracts, it pushes on all the stuff in your abdomen. So it's pushing on, you know, the, the stomach and the intestine, liver, all that. It's kind of compressing it. That's pushing on the inferior vena cava. And that's propelling the blood up. Because blood wants to go, you know, from a, from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. So diaphragm flattens down, that's squeezing everything in your guts. I'm over-exaggerating when I say it, but you know, it's squeezing everything in your guts, pushing up against your inferior vena cava, and that is pushing the blood up towards your heart. So you have a, a respiratory pump and you have a skeletal muscle pump. Both of those mechanisms help to get blood from your lower extremities up toward your heart. Because the pressure goes from like 100 millimeters of mercury in the arteries to like 10 or lower millimeters of mercury in the veins. That vein is fine, kind of, you know, it's okay if it's in your arms or your neck. In your legs, it's a bit more of a problem. This, which I'm not going to keep it on this slide, um... But this is talking about regulation of blood pressure. We talked about regulation of heart rate in the last chapter. 
this is similar, but it's regulation of blood pressure. But you notice some similarities. You notice these receptors, proprioceptors and baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. They're largely located, by the way, in your carotid <clears throat> arteries in your aorta. So right around here, your aorta's here, and then your carotids tap off of it. They're around there. They're sensing, like we talked about last time, limb movement and uh, pressure and chemicals, um, in particular, like oxygen and carbon dioxide. They're communicating with your cardiovascular center, which is your medulla. It's in your, your brain, medulla oblongata. It's in your brain stem. Right? And then there's other nerves that go out. So parasympathetic rest and digest so that's going to be the opposite of fight or flight so in this case parasympathetic is slowing heart rate down or it could do the opposite it could accelerate heart rate either way this is going to come from the um the vagus nerve is usually the so you, if you remember the you have uh 12 cranial nerves um you might have memorized them. You're not, you're not going to really need all of them, but one that does come back is the tenth cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. Right, that one continues past your shoulders. Right, most of the the cranial nerves end in your head or neck. Your accessory nerve goes like into your shoulders, but the vagus nerve continues down to your heart and um, even all the way down to your stomach. So it's the only one of your cranial nerves that continues, the 10th cranial nerve or, or vagus nerve. <clears throat> so that's going to increase heart rate. Increased heart rate is going to increase blood pressure. Or we can, we can have vasoconstriction directly from the cardiovascular center. So that's a... Um, that's a neurological way to do it compress make your heart speed up and uh, constrict your blood vessels we have chemicals that can do the same thing so again you can make an argument for epinephrine it's going to speed heart rate but let's get to the blood vessels actually i've got this written down somewhere oh this is just a, a different photo of the same thing so like you have these baroreceptors for example this is the ones in your carotid, this is the ones in your aorta, and they're going to send a message to your cardiovascular center. So that's in your brainstem. Then that is going to go to your blood vessels or your heart. Right? See, like they've got it here going to your, your SA node and your AV node. That's going to speed heart rate. Um, here, I'm imagining that these are eventually going to go to blood vessels. They're not showing it to you. By the way, the spinal cord, you should view this. Never mind. So I've got this written down. Let me get to it. Um, this is talking about hormones. I have it on a different slide. Um, there we go. <clears throat> so go to the chemical side. Renin-angiotensin, that whole complex, right? That raises blood pressure. How exactly at the end of it all? Because aldosterone, renin-angiotensin, aldosterone, aldosterone is going to conserve sodium, and that's going to hold on to water. So that's that first bullet point. Don't forget, angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin II by itself is a vasoconstrictor. That's going to raise blood pressure. So if I were to do this a little bit different, I would put for the first bullet point, aldosterone. The second bullet point, I would put angiotensin II because aldosterone is going to help you ultimately hold on to water because it holds on to sodium. Angiotensin II is going to be a vasoconstrictor. And then the next bullet point is epinephrine, norepinephrine. That's all about your heart. So that's going to, to increase your 
um, heart rate and norepinephrine will con increase your contractility. So the forcefulness of the contraction. The next one, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. It does the same thing, right? Antidiuretic hormone constricts your blood vessels. It's, it's vasopressin, right? So it's a vaso, vasoconstrictor. And it tells your kidneys to conserve water. So it's similar in conserving water. That's a similar function to um, aldosterone. In um, vasoconstriction, that's a similar function to angiotensin II. A and P, if you remember, atrial natriuretic peptide is a, it does the opposite. It does the opposite of antidiuretic hormone. So you're going to, it'll slow heart rate. It's a vasodilator. It encourages your body to get rid of water. It does all the things that your body has set up to raise blood pressure. A and P is going to do the opposite. So if I ask, if I were to ask you on a test, don't just write down four bullet points like I have listed here. I'm going to definitely take off points for that. I want to know what ADH does. I want to know what ANP does. Why did you put epi nor epi? Do you even know what that stands for? I know you're saying to yourself, yes, I do, but you'd be surprised. People just write, it's letters. They're symbols, E-P-I. Like, what does it stand for? No idea. You put that on your slide. Like you should know what epinephrine does by now. I, I know you do. But what does norepinephrine do, right? So it increases contractility. <laughs> Don't just put baroreceptors CNIX. What does that mean, CNIX? You like, I mean, I, you, you probably know, but I mean, I hate when, when people write things down and they have no idea. It's just CNIX. It's that card game that you flip one over and you're like, where's the other card that was that symbol? Oh, it's over here. It's just, that's all it is. Okay, anyway. Um, I don't know why I put CNIX. Don't worry about that one. We can say forcefulness of contraction for nor Norpe. Absolutely. I just want you to have some idea of what, like when I write these out, I'm being lazy and maybe I shouldn't be lazy when I write them out, but um, I'm Bobby Brown. So I don't know if you older people will get my reference. So, but for you, you have to, um, you know, I want to know that you know what, what I'm talking about. You know, what do the chemicals mean? And yeah, the receptor is fine. That's where they are, you know, where, what are they doing? You know, they're, they're communicating with the cardiovascular center, or if you want to say brainstem or medulla oblongata, whatever word you want to use for it, it's communicating with that, right? And then your brain, your cardiovascular center is able to speed up heart rate or slow it down and constrict your blood vessels or, or dilate them. So it controls your heart rate and controls your blood vessels. That controls blood pressure. Higher the heart rate, higher the blood pressure. Constricting your blood vessels, blood pressure up. I'm going to come back to this. Well, I'm not going to come back to this slide, but I'm going to talk about something similar with the next slide. So, that was, that's kind of similar. It has some similarities with control of heart rate. So that should, some of that should look familiar to you, except that now we're adding in, before you had epinephrine, norepinephrine, and um, there were some other things like some, like calcium and stuff like that. But here I'm adding in, oh, and a &P was there in control of heart rate. It also controls blood pressure, right? But ADH, I, that's new and renin angiotensin aldosterone that's new hypoperfusion is otherwise known as shock 
hypo meaning under perfusion, talking about your cells getting oxygenated. So your cells are not getting oxygenated enough. That's what shock is. Shock is when your body cannot deliver enough oxygen to get to your tissues. That's what it technically is. Most of the time, but not all the time, but most of the time, it's going to be because of blood pressure. The reason you cannot get oxygen to different places in your body, different tissues, is because you have low blood pressure. So why? Why you have low blood pressure? That tells you the different types of shock. And the first is the most obvious one. <clears throat> Decreased blood volume. So going like this, like I'm going to say something. Dehydration. That's going to cause decreased blood volume. You're dehydrated, low, uh, um, low blood, low water means low blood volume means low blood pressure, right? So extreme dehydration, and along with that, something called hyponatremia, meaning low sodium. So when you have low sodium in your body, that can actually cause you to be dehydrated and um, that's, that, that could cause hypovolemic shock. So hypo under volemic volume, right? Low blood volume. Um, you know, other things, diuretics, too much diuretics, um, vomiting, diarrhea, stuff like that. Get, getting shot, bleeding out, that causes low blood volume. Don't know why I didn't mention that first. So low blood volume. Second, you got a messed up heart. Your heart's the one that's pumping all of this around, right? So if your heart's not pumping, blood's not moving. Your pressure's down. Or if your heart is more typically, if your heart is pumping but not correctly, something's wrong with it, especially the... um. Well, it doesn't matter whatever ventricle it is, either of them, really. If they're not working like they should and and they're not pushing out blood, that's going to cause shock. So that's cardiogenic, meaning that it's getting generated with the heart. Your heart is what's causing it. The third one, obstructive. Um, and by the way, sometimes there's other names for these types of shock and if you see another name don't you know just roll with it like when you get into nursing or wherever you might see instead of vascular you might see um can't even think of the word right now um um brain neurogenic right instead of vascular i put vascular some people put neurogenic they're they're both correct right so you might see different words in the future it's the same idea, right? Let me go back to obstructive. Obstructive is something blocking your blood vessels. I put PE, that means pulmonary embolism. That's an example of obstructive. That's not the only obstructive. I was just giving you an example. Cardiogenic, I put MI, myocardial infarction. That's an example of cardiogenic, a heart attack. That's not the only cardiogenic. That's just an example. Pulmonary embolism, is not the only obstructive, it's just an example. It's like a common, common example that you would see. So, um, <clears throat> vascular, um, too much dilation. And I spelled it wrong. See, I told you guys I always spell this thing wrong. Not dilation, dilation. So, inappropriate dilation. You're, you're, if you get stung by a bee, wherever you got stung, I would expect those blood vessels to dilate, not every blood vessel in your body. That's an inappropriate reaction. If they all dilate, your blood pressure is going to plummet. That's a type of shock. These aren't, this is not all the types of shock. There's, there's, um, for example, I didn't get septic shock, right? But these are kind of, they can be grouped together. They have similar uh, symptoms. Usually, um, a blood pressure will be close together, not like 40 apart, like 120 over 80. They'll be like 20 apart. 
and it'll be lower. So the 120 will be like 90. And then the 80 will be like, you know, 65 or something, you know, 85 over 65. That's maybe something. And then you would have a high, high, um, elevated heart rate because your body's trying to compensate. Right. Those would be like, those would be like some signs of, of shock. And so what can your body do about it? Get blood pressure up. I don't, even know. I don't even know if I made that a slide. I did. Honestly, the answer is the same as the slide where we talk about control of blood pressure. Just think about what does your body do to get blood pressure up? That's the answer to shock compensation. Those are compensatory mechanisms. You kick in the, well, actually, the third bullet point is first. That's what your body does first, right? Because that's the quickest thing. Send a signal from your cardiovascular center down to your blood vessels to constrict. That's the first thing you're going to do. Don't get rid of any more water. Save it. Um, maybe don't sweat depending on where you are, right? You want to hold water and you want to constrict blood vessels. That's a first from your brain. That's the first compensatory, um, mechanism. Then you're going to send some, you're going to follow it up with some hormones, right? Because your brain works quick, but you can't hold it as long. Hormones take a little bit longer to work but you can hold it for longer. So you follow it up. You follow it up. I'm going to have to get this door. So I'm going to have to give you guys a break for a second. You follow it up with hormones, renin, angiotensin, angiotensin 2, ADH, not ANP, right? That's the opposite. All right. Give me a second, please. You got it? He go and answer the Amazon man. They're doing some work out in my front yard. So they're telling me that they're leaving. Yeah, so let me put you guys on hold for a second. Sorry. Oh, do they just need the bathroom? Yeah. Okay, are you good with everything else? All right, thanks. I just needed the bathroom. Actually, I got to plug in anyway. I'm glad that that happened. I would have run out of battery. That would have been great for you guys. Run out of battery, computer shut off. Whoever rang the doorbell messed you guys up because now I'm charging. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, we just think about blood pressure. What's going to get up? What's going to get your blood pressure up? That's the answer for shock. So, you know, what are, you need to know what are the forms of shock? <clears throat> you know, list some types of shock. And uh, talk about how your body can compensate for shock. Um, we do. We compensate for shock. Um, kids are a little different. They, they, they're actually really good at compensating for shock. And so um, they're really good at compensating for shock. So they'll like, uh, you know, like when, when we go into shock, we start going down slowly, kind of like that. You see it getting worse. Take a blood pressure, do another blood pressure five minutes later, it's worse. Do another one worse, right? It just keeps getting worse. They keep they keep getting worse. Kids kind of hold that. They're really good at compensating. They hold it, but then when they lose it, it they just plummet, right? They just drop. So that's why, like, kids, you know um, – that's why you gotta be like more careful. There's no, there's, there's no signs, right? They're still walking around and stuff and then they just can't compensate anymore. Um, all right. So 
types of shock, how does our body compensate for shock? Control of blood pressure. Yeah, go ahead. Well, when you say the types of shock, you're basically talking about the, the four that you listed. Those are the types, right? The yeah. Dehydration, <clears throat> low sodium. And then how does how does our body compensate it? Um, and that's with the renin, ADH, and all of that stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. You just think about what you know about the body and how we keep blood pressure up, and that's really the answer. Resistance, what are the factors? leading to resistance or factors causing resistance. Um, yeah. Um, it would be nice if you knew what blood pressure was, like what it actually is, not just like the pressure of your blood, but you know, it's, Whatever artery, usually we take it on the brachial artery right up in the arm, but that doesn't have to be the only place you can do it. You know, well, what if, what if someone has like a, they have like a port, like a shunt in one arm because that's where they get like hooked up for infusions or something like that, right? So you can't, can't use that arm because that's got like a thing in it. You can't put a cuff around it. The other arm, they've got, they've got like some IVs going in it. Can't take it on that arm. So you can come down here to the forearm, you can go to their leg even, right? So you can take blood pressures different places. Um, but usually we use the brachial artery. And so what's the pressure, what's the average pressure on that artery, on the wall of the artery when the heart's contracting? And then your second number is what is it when the heart's relaxing? Or to be more particular during ventricular contraction and ventricular relaxation. Or to just use the words during ventricular systole and ventricular diastole. I don't care about mean arterial pressure, even though I probably should, because I know that people use that. But whatever, you'll learn it. But, yeah. What do you mean when you say, what are the factors that's leading to resistance? Like what the are the factors of, of resistance? Oh, of resistance. Cause, causing resistance. What slows down your blood? That's really what I'm saying. Okay. Oh, what slows down the blood? Yeah. I mean, no, I'll, probably, I'll, probably, I'll be using the word resistance, but that's what I'm asking you. So smaller lumen, smaller blood. The, 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 that's going to slow down the blood. What is lumen? Like the, the whole, like the lumen of this glass is like two inches. It's like the space. Oh, like the, the, the space of it. So the, skinnier, the, small, the skinnier I make that, if it's more like a test tube, that's going to go a lot slower. Okay. Okay, I get it. Then the, how many vessels? The more, the more vessels you got to go through, okay. the more resistance that is. Okay. And then the thickness is the last yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Pressure's driving filtration. Pressure's driving reabsorption. Remember, filtration is fluid leaving the capillary, reabsorption fluid going back into the capillary. So you've got this exchange between the capillary, the blood, and then the interstitial fluid. So I've got here two pressures driving filtration and one pressure driving reabsorption. Is the albumin greater in the blood? that's driving reabsorption. Is the albumin greater in the interstitial fluid? That's driving filtration. 
just that we gave it confusing names. Blood colloid osmotic pressure, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. Whenever you see some talk of osmotic something, they're talking about osmosis, the diffusion of water. So water goes from like a higher concentration to a lower concentration. But it's weird when you, and I'm not gonna like explain it in here, but when you add something like salt, like sodium, or you add albumin or some kind of solute, for some reason, water considers that place to be lower density, right? In your head, you're thinking, well, if I pour a bunch of water in, uh, pour a bunch of salt into water, that's more dense, right? Seawater, you would think seawater is more dense than like tap water or bottled water, right? But that's not how other molecules of water look at it. They look at it being the opposite. They're like, oh, seawater, that's where I want to be. It's like more, it's like less concentrated in the seawater than in the bottle of drinking water. It's the opposite of what we would think that makes sense. So just remember it that way. Water always goes to wherever there's more sodium, albumin, whatever it is, solutes. So in this case, it's albumin. If you put more albumin in the blood, water wants to move into the blood. Put more albumin outside the blood, water wants to move out of the blood. And then of course, there's your heart, just general pressure, blood pressure. That, that helps to push fluid out of your blood. Three types of capillaries. Continuous, fenestrated, sinusoid. What's the difference between them? Continuous capillaries only have those intercellular clefts. When you get to fenestrated capillaries, those intercellular clefts are a little bit larger. And then there's all these fenestrations or pores. Sinusoid. With sinusoid, you take, if you want, you could take the same definition that you put for fenestrated and just use the words really big. That's essentially what it is. Really big fenestration, really big fenestrations, really big intercellular clefts. We talked about sinusoids being present in um, the liver, red bone marrow, things like that. And then at the other extreme, we talked about the blood brain barrier. So, like in your brain, you'd have continuous capillaries. <coughs> But I might ask you about the three types of capillaries. Don't just list. Say why they're different. And a capillary, remember, a capillary is just made from epithelial cells. Or here we're calling them endothelial cells. It's end, endothelial cells covered with a basement membrane. That's all it is. That's all you're looking at. Capillaries are not very complicated. There's not a lot of thickness to their walls. There's no elastic, there's no muscle, just epithelial cells and a basement, mem basement membrane. They're very simple things. Two types of arteries, <laughs> conducting and distributing arteries. That would be a possible question. Kind of an easy one. Elastics found closer to the heart. Muscular further away from the heart. You cannot, when we talk about this notion of vasoconstriction, like to raise blood pressure, right? Can't do that with arteries that are right next to the heart. You can't, you cannot constrict those. You want to constrict blood vessels to get blood pressure up, you don't want to impede the ventricles. Can't, yeah, I already talked about that. So two types of arteries.
I think that's probably it too. I'm not going to ask you. That's more of an anatomy. So we got from this chapter, which you're going to add to your heart chapter, we have one, two, three types of capillaries, three, four, that's an easy one, five, Six. Seven. It's part of seven. So seven questions. I will probably ask five of them. So you've got a test bank here of seven questions that I'm going to ask, that I could ask. I'll ask five of them. Same thing from the heart. I'll ask probably five questions from the heart. Five questions from the question on blood vessels. I mean, the chapter on blood vessels. You're thinking right now, are you going to ask the exact same questions on the test? Not all of them. I mean, yes, some of them. I, you know, I'm going to ask about car, uh, cardiac cycle. I keep talking about that. And I devoted like a few slides to it. So cardiac cycle is going to be on there. Um, short of that. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to pick. I just kind of make it up right before I do it. But, you know, it's the same. I have the same questions in my head. I mean, same every semester, it's the same questions. And I already told you what all the questions are for the heart. So it's like no surprise. You just probably have about 15 questions. Which is a lot, I know. I'm saying um, I make it. I always make it sound like it's not a big deal, and I'll probably pick ten of those, ten or eleven. But you know what all the questions are. It's the same thing I say every week. You know what the questions are. You just gotta, you know, prepare yourself. Get the questions ready. Like get your answers ready. I would write them down. I, I know some of you hate writing stuff down. It it for 95% of, of humanity, it works as far as like learning stuff, to write it down. You're probably gonna throw it away. You are, I mean, it helps though. Learning, learning by our phones suck. I mean, it only, it, 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 it doesn't suck. It works, but only up to a certain extent. Yes, you can go through your slides, sitting on the toilet what else are you going to do you're going to watch youtube videos or you're going to watch this so shouldn't even have the phone in the bathroom but you know you do so um but you should be writing this stuff down you're going to write it down on the test so write it down you know so that's the i'm not done for today but um I got I to gotta move on to like some other material, but does anyone have any questions about exam? I don't even know what we're on. Exam two? Is that what we're on, exam two? You've taken one quiz, two quizzes and one exam. Yeah, exam two. Does anyone have any questions about exam two? Yeah, you're all still here. Just making sure. All right. So exam two is Thursday, right? Thursday. Okay. In class. Every Thursday is in class. Every Thursday we have a quiz or an exam. Sorry. I was like staring at it for a few minutes too. Oh, you know what? Let me stop recording and then I'll start recording a, a new. So I'm going to stop here because I want to post this one today. And then I'll start a new one and I'll put that under the heading of quiz three. I did stop recording.